A warm hello and welcome to the Electro Integrity Project's fourth annual online conference. It's great to welcome you here for a week of election research workshops, uh, which we'd like to call the Glastonbury of Elections Research. This week uh, is convened by myself, Toby James, based here in Norwich at the University of East Anglia, Holly Ann Garnett, who you'll see shortly, and also Anna Unger, who we are delighted to have as part of our team this year. We have also been working with International Idea, IFAS, and the Carter Center, so our sincerest thanks to, to all those organizations for their ongoing support uh, for the project. Now, 2024 was supposed to be the year of elections. According to Time magazine, writing in December of 2023, 2024 is not just an election year, it's perhaps the election year. election year. Globally, more voters than ever in history will head to the polls as at least 64 countries, plus the European Union, representing a population of about 49% of people in the world will be having the chance to cast their ballots. It's therefore a moment of great opportunity, potentially of great change, where citizens have the chance to express their views about how they want to be governed, they have the chance to change their government, to change their representatives, or to renew their mandates for another term of office. But it's also a year in which there have been major concerns being raised about democratic backsliding around the world. According to International IDEA, for example, in last year's global state of democracy, half of all countries saw declines in at least one of their indicators of democracy over the past five years. So this opening panel begins to tackle this pressing issue. In a moment, we have an expert panel, uh, country experts looking at five key elections around the world, which potentially gives us a half-time report about the quality of elections that we've seen so far. But first of all, uh, as ever, what we do in our opening session is to introduce the latest Electoral Integrity Project data on election quality around the world. And I'll hand over at this point to my colleague, Holly Ann Garnett. Perfect, thank you so much, Toby. Um, and so, yeah, it's our pleasure as the Electoral Integrity Project to welcome you all here. Um, I wanted to give you an update on what we've been up to and uh, present your first sneak peek at the um, year in elections report that we'll be releasing this week uh, in conjunction with the workshop. Um, so as you know, or maybe don't know, the Electoral Integrity Project focuses on three main questions. Um, how and when do elections fail throughout the entire electoral cycle? What are the consequences um, for things like security, accessibility, and public trust? And what can be done to mitigate these problems based on various forms of academic evidence? Um, and so the EIP is not just myself and Toby, who are co-directors, but also a whole team of people. We have uh, every year a cohort of fellows, many of whom are in the room right now, um, who take part in uh, research projects relating to electoral integrity. We have a fantastic advisory board. Um, and so these are just some of the people who are involved in the EIP. And as Toby mentioned, we do some data collection, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, research, uh, including academic outputs and policy related outputs, training like the fellowship program, um, and building networks, which is what we're doing this week. So I will be presenting the first look at our uh, 2023 Perceptions of Electoral Integrity Index data set, uh, fresh off the presses, and um, some of the highlights of what we've seen from last year's set of elections as we move into this conversation about what we're seeing this year. Um, so the PEI index has been running since 2012, so founded by Pippa Norris, who started the Electoral Integrity Project 
Um, and this year was a we saw a, a quite a huge overhaul of our PEI index. We've been listening to a lot of concerns, questions about the data. Um, we've we've read some articles that have come out about that. So we've uh, done a bit of an overhaul of the PEI index while also respecting the longitudinal aspect that everybody has come to know and love about the PEI index. Um, and so essentially the PEI index is an expert survey um, sent out about a month after every national level election around the world. Uh, it used to include 49 indicators. Now we have 62 indicators. Uh, reflecting the needs of some additional uh, scholars and the needs of um, to really update how we evaluate elections around the globe. Um, so this, this uh, survey goes out after every national level election, and then uh, we bring back the data. Um, we have a new strategy this year for missing data. Uh, previously, multiple imputation had been used, but there's been some um, challenges with that. And so we've, we've tried to leave the data in as much of a raw form as possible. Um, so that researchers are able to use missing data and deal with missing data with using the strategies, the theoretical strategies that they feel are most appropriate. We also have some very exciting new overall indices building on some work that Toby and I have been doing throughout the last couple of years, building a new conceptualization of electoral integrity. So the new data set has the new concept-based index. Um, so essentially, this index is based on the four principles of electoral integrity um, that we've outlined in some of our recent work, the equality of contestation, equality of participation, deliberation, and adjudication. So now we have principal indices, so an overall index of these four pre key components, and an overall concept-based index, which is not just additive, but really based on this theoretical work that we've been doing to reconceptualize electoral integrity. In addition, the additive indexes are still available, um, and we have a 47 indicator additive index, which does change the previous index a little bit. It gets rid of two different um, indicators, uh, and then also the 62 variable additive index. We continue to have available the electoral cycle stage indexes, but we also have ones that include new questions. And then the legacy indexes remain for those who are interested to, to do any comparative work. So there's lots of different ways now that you can um, overall conceptualize and measure electoral integrity in terms of an overall measure. So today I'll be showing you mostly the concept index um, from the most recent election in each country. So here's our famous um, color-coded map uh, looking at the PEI concept index. Uh, this includes not just elections from 2023, but whatever the most recent election is uh, in each country. Um, and so uh, you'll you'll notice some of the same trends that we've seen over time uh, because this does include the most recent election. Um, and so the other thing that we we can note is the performance across the stages of electoral cycles. So this is just for 2023. Um, there's two things that I want to highlight here in this graph. Uh, the first is that campaign media and campaign finance remains um, the biggest challenge to elections globally. This has been the case since 2012. Every year we look at the um, means of different electoral cycle stages, and that remains the key issue, this deliberative space. Um, we see that show up also in the deliberative index now, which tends to be the lowest. Um, that the key issue to elections is maybe not necessarily how votes are counted, but how we get to that point and how individuals make up their minds and the environment that they're in to be able to really debate. Um, elections are one of these key moments where an entire population is debating the future of their polity. And so if those debates are not predicated on, on quality and equal content um, deliberation, then we see some, some key challenges to electoral integrity. And once again, campaign media and finance tend to be the lowest. We also, I want to highlight um, that we've included many new indicators in the voting section. Previously, a lot of the indicators were based on the technicalities of voting, but we've included some new indicators that look at the equality of voting. So is there equal turnout among population groups? Is there... Um, 
a, a, a wide ability to participate among um, all individuals within a polity. And so this is why you see, uh, depending on the way that you aggregate the, the stage of elector of the voting part of the electoral cycle, you'll notice that there's there's quite a dip from the past, um, from the previous um, 42 indicator mean, because of some of these new indicators, really focusing this on this idea of equal and full and wide participation in elections. Um, and so, as I mentioned, you can also look at specific principles of electoral integrity. And again, this deliberative space tends to be the one that uh, has some of the biggest challenges um, in electoral integrity. And so we're excited to do some more work looking at these key principles. Um, also, over time trends are really interesting to look at. Um, we don't notice any major changes, dips or drops um, when we look based uh, basically, since the 2012 data, this follows on to some work that we've done on democratic backsliding, which uh, suggested that maybe elections are not the area that are first targeted in terms of democratic backsliding, um, that other areas uh, in, in terms of the, the quality of liberal democracy tend to be targeted first, um, and elections are not necessarily uh, where um, that democratic backsliding is always first targeted. The other thing we can note, because we do have over 10 years now of longitudinal data, is where elections are improving, where they're um, declining. Um, so we noticed some of the biggest declines in Zimbabwe's election in 2023, um, but at the same time, some increases in Thailand's election uh, in 2023, um, looking at some of the key areas of the electoral cycle. And while these contests in, for example, in Thailand are not necessarily still up, up at the top, they're not moving up to the top, um, you, you can see some ability to bounce back after key challenges to electoral integrity. And so we focus a bit on some of those contests too, where we see some of the biggest changes um, and, and seeing where they, they pick up in the electoral cycle. One other thing I wanted to flag, um, just in case there's any electoral management in um, uh, uh, individuals, people who maybe work for an EMB, um, we also have an ongoing electoral management survey. We're just finishing up data collection for that. Um, and so we've had a number of EMBs already take part. This is a collaborative survey uh, with other, other colleagues and other scholars. Um, and so we just popped our, our email in there if you want to send us an email. If you are coming from an EMB that um, has yet to respond, uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to talk more about the electoral management survey. Um, this is the third iteration of it and uh, having wide participation from electoral management bodies around the globe uh, is really helpful. Um, so we really do look forward to hearing from you if you are coming from an EMB. So we're going to move on to um, the year in elections, the story of electoral integrity and malpractice so far. Um, we've had a, a little bit of a change to our programming, but I'll introduce each of the scholars who are now going to be uh, sharing a little bit about the elections that have happened within their countries um, and uh, give us some of the some of the insights that we're interested to see how things are going, as Toby mentioned. Um, a bit of a, a mid-year report on the quality of elections. So let me just pull up that. Um, so we have uh, some distinguished panelists today, uh, five of them. Um, we have Ursula von Beck and Kira Alberts coming from Stellenbosch University. Um, and they'll be speaking to us a bit about the South African elections. We have Anna Unger coming from uh, Oivish Lauren University in Hungary, uh, who will be speaking a bit about the local elections that happened in Hungary. Um, Zad Momen uh, is coming from the Presidency University in India, will be speaking about Indian elections that happened. And Miguel Oatola, from, uh, who's an international expert, um, will be speaking a bit about the elections in Mexico. So we have a really Great. Oh, and sorry. And Toby James, who you saw earlier, will be speaking about the very recent UK elections um, in the UK. So we have uh, five fantastic scholars who are going to be speaking um, to the experiences so far. Um, we're really mm -hmm. interested in knowing uh, what are some of the major concerns about democracy and electoral integrity? Um, what were anticipated to be some of the biggest challenges? What eventually ended up being the main problems? Um, and 
to what extent certain issues, for example, of the campaign deliberative space ended up being a problem um, and whether any interesting interventions were used. So what I'll do is each uh, speaker is going to have about eight minutes to give a bit, a bit of an overview um, of the election, how things went, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation together um, about um, the quality of elections in each of those cases. So I'd like to first uh, send it over to uh, Ursula and Kira, who are looking at the South African elections. Um, and perhaps you could give us a bit of a, an introduction to what, what happened, what some of the major issues were, um, and we're very keen to hear, hear more. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as far as the overview is concerned, well, um, the elections were long anticipated. It's a complete change of our political scene in this country because after 30 years of ANC majority rule, uh, the ANC has failed to achieve this majority. And uh, therefore, uh, we started looking at various, not we, but the politicians have started looking at various scenarios that moving forward. And uh, we have there were various considerations. The one was a um, coalition between the two major parties, that would be the ANC and the uh, Democratic Alliance, who jointly won over 62% of the, of the vote. Uh, then there was the idea of, of um, perhaps having no coalition, but, but uh, all the decisions taken by the minority government and approved by the parliament. And, and finally, uh, to our actual relief, uh, the idea of uh, the government of national unity was created. And in our opinion, it has not taken too long to come to a decision to, to the appointment of cabinet, mainly because uh, it seems that the parties, however widely different they may be, and they stretch from the Communist Party all the way to a Liberal uh, Party, um, nevertheless, despite these uh, various distinctions in, in political, uh, ideological... Um... <laughs> Hello, Kat! Um, <laughs> we have uh, achieved the government of uh, national unity in a peaceful manner, uh, fairly quickly established, and it consists of, of many country, uh, parties of which three actually play the, ma uh, play the major role for, for the foreseeable future, and that would be the DN, uh, ANC, the Democratic Alliance, um, and the IFP, which stands for Inkata uh, Party, um, Independent Party, which is particularly popular in the Zulu part of the uh, country. And then there are several other uh, parties which also represent uh, the, the so-called colored community in the Cape. Uh, the DA, uh, which is the Liberal Party I mentioned, has its roots in the anti-apartheid struggle uh, since 1959, but it's perceived widely as a white party, representing white, uh, the white um, voters. And then we have a, a party that various other parties, such as the representation of, of the Muslim community and so forth. So it's a huge spread, and so far they have talking, have been talking to each other, and uh, well, so far so good. But as I said, it is very early days, and it's very difficult to um, to judge what will come. But we are fairly optimistic. There's one you, you discussed uh, widely. We talked about the electoral um, uh, issues. Um, and there has been one uh, approach to the, inter to the uh, IEC uh, with complaints from a newly created country, uh, party called Umkonto the Siswe, which is run by the former uh, president Jacob Zuma, who accused the IEC of misconduct. Uh, the IEC has re uh, refuted, they said that, that there is no evidence whatsoever, so they went to the, to the court, the electoral court. And, the, and uh, the, the process was supposed to start, but yesterday they have withdrawn the case. So we don't know where that is going to go. But otherwise, uh, generally, our um, in, um, electoral commission is considered widely to be trustworthy and unbiased. And my colleague here would like to say a few words about the issue that we have, we have uh, requested, and that is about 
misinformation um, that may have happened or, or not. So I give the floor to Kira. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you about this. I apologize for the background noise. They have uh, mysteriously started doing construction right as <laughs> the present <laughs> presentation started. But in terms of mission information, it's obviously quite a wide topic and there's a lot that we can say about it. So I'll just broadly speak about a couple of streams of misinformation and topics that we saw uh, become prominent throughout this election. Um, it has, I, I first thing want to start by also making the distinction between misinformation and disinformation, whereas disinformation refers to more deliberately sp spread uh, false or wrong information. And it's quite difficult to speak to that, uh, although highly problematic, uh, you know, we don't always know the intention with which it is, is sprayed. Um, but as far as we can tell in this election, there have been no marked deliberative misinformation and disinformation campaigns coming from sort of strategic uh, companies trying to sway the voters or outcome, as we saw happen in South Africa uh, with Bal Passenger circa 2017. So speaking about uh, misinformation, one of the first and most damaging streams of misinformation we saw come through during this election was towards the Independent Electoral Commission or IEC who run our elections. So a lot of misinformation was spread around the process of the elections uh, and also cast doubt on the legitimacy of the South African elections. Uh, for example, there was a big rumor going around that if you choose to not vote in the election, that your vote would automatically go to the ANC African National Congress. Uh, and it made the rounds on Facebook and, and a lot of WhatsApp groups. And of course, that is quite damaging. And then as we saw after the fact of the elections and, and then going to the Cizwe party, uh, starting to cast doubts on the legitimacy of the elections um, and starting to call for a redo or a recount, uh, a lot of misinformation was also spread uh, along those lines. Then the second stream, uh, sort of feeding into what I just mentioned about the Mugonsu Esizwe party, uh, a relatively young party on our scene created at, towards the end of last year with uh, Jacob Zuma at the helm. Uh, we also see, saw a lot of misinformation spread around the party and the role that Jacob Zuma would be able to play in politics, uh, given that he has a criminal conviction to his name and uh, we didn't know if he would be able to have a seat in parliament and so on. So a lot of misinformation and sort of rumors spreading around those lines and, um, you know, casting doubt on, again, the legitimacy, but also a sort of fear mongering and, and threatening that if Zuma were not to get his way, we would have mass riots and creating a lot of fear among the voters, which, uh, you know, can be largely damaging. So that is a very broad overview. Uh, of course, there's much more to say, so look forward to the Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kira and Ursula. Um, yeah, so we'll go through each of the elections and we'll have a bit more of a discussion to dig into some of these issues. This is great. Um, uh, so moving around the world, uh, we have Anna Unger, uh, who will speak a bit about the Hungarian elections. Um, so Anna, would you like to... Uh, thank you. Hopefully you, you you hear me and thanks for... Yes. For, for having me here and I'm really happy to to summarize the big picture and the recent outcomes and uh, I don't want to talk too much about the Hungarian background however it is important to mention that even the nature of the system is to say the least is under challenge or uh, the European Parliament a couple of months maybe a year ago declared Hungary as a electoral authoritarian hybrid regime and the, the democratic nature of the country is, is to say the least less and less acknowledged which means that the the daily democratic procedures and the daily democratic content of the whole system is is less and less available however however elections still matter and the, the government puts a huge uh how to say uh, puts a huge uh effort into maintaining the electoral facade of the system regarding the parliamentary election, elections and the local elections as well. 
However, the governing party, Fidesz and the Prime Minister Orban, has a constant two-third majority in the parliament, which means that we have a written fundamental law or basic law, and whenever they want to amend it, whenever they want to introduce something new, they have on their own this con so-called constitutional majority to do whatever they want. There is no minority veto anymore in the system, so opposition parties cannot um, have any say in the procedural changes or the or the, the 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 factual changes of the system, which means that the opposition is extremely undermined in the decision making process. And th this is especially true and especially problematic in case of electoral stuff, electoral system and electoral procedure, because it is okay if you have the the, the governing majority and you pass budget and tax law, whatever, but in case of election, parliaments, and this is also a declaration, a decree of a, of a constitutional court uh, uh, from the 1990s, that when the parliament passes any law regarding elections, it must be neutral in that sense that they cannot favor parliamentary parties, they cannot favor governing parties. So this kind of constitutional requirement was a kind of constitutional tradition which is extremely undermined since 2010. And what happened in this year is that uh, the, 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 the government decided a couple of months before the election, to uh, uh, more than a year before one important thing, that they merged the local election with the European elections. However, the local elections by the normal timeline should have been held only in late in early October, so five months later. However, the government said that okay, it is too expensive to do two elections in a year. We have the coming EP elections. Let's do the one round local elections at the same day. And everybody, uh, of course, the opposition said that this is not fair. How to regulate the 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 minor issues like what happens now and this is also a problem that you have a, a leaving government at the local governments who are not re-elected but they still have five months to do whatever they want and you have a coming mayor who has the local who has the he has the local legitimacy already but has no power to do anything or to prevent uh, bad practices in the government this is so the transition period is not regulated at all and this was uh, uh, this is important. Second, um, uh, the the second problem was that uh, they changed the 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 Budapest elections, which is the capital of Hungary, a couple of months before uh, the elections. Formerly, and this is a regular practice of Fidesz that couple of months, sometimes couple of weeks before the coming elections, they change mayor major major uh, parts of the electoral system. Recently, they changed the electoral system itself. Formerly, the district mayors were delegated to the Budapest Assembly, and now they said that no, the district mayors anymore, but we reinstalled the formerly existed, existed least proportional system, which created a totally new environment, political environment for the opposition parties, how to cooperate, what to do at the European elections, what to do at the local elections. So in some, I don't want to go into details because we have now three hours to explain the whole Orban regime and the practices. But you have to understand what, you, what is important, that this is a regular practice of the government that they always um, check what the opposition does, what the opposition parties do, and they always reframe the legal background and the system in order to prevent any kind of, of overcoming of the opposition or any kind of gains. However, they didn't manage to do this properly in this uh, electoral cycle because um, uh, um, an absolutely unknown guy who became a politician in this late uh, spring uh, 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 put a movement together and they found a party to run and they managed to reach the second place at the at the European election, which is pretty important. And it seems that there can they can somehow challenge Fidesz a couple of years later. But I don't want to talk about the overall political system 
instead i want to mention the 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 problems that is uh, that that are from our perspective are the most important one first is i already mentioned what is all, extremely hurts electoral integrity is this one party systemic changes without social approval without opposition parties being involved in the in the reform process uh, the second is that uh, ele and and i think this is the this is the more important part that it's somehow okay we we learn that we cannot trust the government and the state but the, now the problem is that we cannot trust the electoral management management bodies anymore that there were some kind of we can call them mispractices or maybe malpractices and you know the difference is whether it's unintentional or intentional but recently we we have a situation that we do not actually know who is the lord mayor of budapest because there was a very tricky political campaign uh, gergely karachon who is the mayor who who decided to run again uh, um, he is the, the, the candidate of the opposition, a former secretary of the state who is close to Fidesz, but who ran, uh, who ran as independent, David Vitezi, who actually is an expert in local government and transportation and stuff like this. He, de he decided to run as a kind of independent candidate. And also Fidesz nominated someone who stepped back two days before the election. And here I have to show you the 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 not the slide but the picture of mine uh, to show the the re, the responsibility of electoral management bodies and why I say that it was uh, it was their it is their responsibility to to do something and to how to prevent uh, mispractice or malpractice. Hopefully you see these two uh, slides perfect. I mean, these two ballot, these are the two ballot papers here, and this is the final result. If you see, we have the two leading candidates, Gergely Karacsony. Uh, the difference is, I tell you by numbers because it's too small, it's 41, 41 votes. That's the difference between the two candidates. Gergely Karacsony was the, the candidate of the opposition parties. Uh, David Vitezi was the independent candidate. However, we had the third one, Alexandra Senkirai, who is a, here you can see the sign of Fidesz. However, she resigned two days in the last minute that, uh, that the, the, the electoral procedure law allows to step back to resign. And one problem came from the removal of the candidate from the ballot papers. It says that if you want to, pa to cast a formal or valid vote you can vote only for one candidate and the law says that you have to remove the candidate by uh, um, drawing a line here are the two different lines hopefully you can see it in some districts uh, the 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 reside candidate was removed this way in other districts the candidate was removed this way it was in some districts it was a very thin line and it's still not the the problem itself the problem itself that many people many voters cast their vote that first they voted for alexandra center kirai because they did not really recognize this line and then they realized that oh this is a this is a bad vote this is this is not okay because she already resigned so i have to choose a new one and they usually voted for david Fide david vitesi because fides declared that they support uh, vitesi instead and the problem came here that in some districts the votes that were cast first for the resigned uh, candidate then for the the next one who was already in competition they were declared as informal invalid votes while in other districts uh, these votes these ballot papers were declared as formal or valid votes and the result you can see it was very very thin i mean the difference the after the first count it was a, around 300 votes and then the second uh, candidate david vitesi said they he proposed that okay we need a recount here and uh, 
Then they collected all the informal votes, and here came the problems because they. Uh, uh, the, but, but the problem is that the whole recounting procedure is not regulated by the law. So different districts started to do it a different way. And then the, the, the Budapest office, the, the National Electoral Office said that, OK, all informal votes should be transported into the headquarters of the National Electoral Office. No one knew how, what happened with the ballot boxes. We can trust the transporters or we cannot trust the transporters because it's not regulated and it was absolutely public there were cameras around the 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 vote counting hall they counted more than 22,000 informal votes and then the final result had been declared the mayor who has been re-elected he proposed uh, he proposed to have uh, uh, a new election, I mean a repeated election. David Vitesi said that, okay, let's have a, a repeated election or recount the old votes. And just yesterday, the Constitutional Court declared that Budapest has to recount every formal vote. And the problem now is that no one knows how the votes will be recounted. And what is really problematic, I guess, in a nutshell to summarize is that the trust in the electoral management bodies is totally lost in the society. And I think this is the final step when you cannot trust the election anymore, not because of the governing party, but the local officers also. This is this is probably the biggest challenge recently, and I don't know how to overcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, lots to discuss there, so hopefully we'll be able to get, get back to that in the Q&A. Um, but I did want to turn to Zad Moment um, with the Indian elections. So we're going all over the world today. Um, so Zad, did, did you want to, to jump in here? Yes, uh, I would. Uh, I would begin by extending my gratitude to you and Toby and the entire EIP team for organizing this panel and extending me the invitation. Uh, the 2024 elections marked a watershed moment for India and uh, fraught with profound challenges for electoral integrity. Uh, as it is said, uh, any election in India, the, just the sheer logistical scale of conducting elections uh, stands as a formidable challenge, right? Uh, the elections spanned over six weeks, seven phases. There were 744 political parties. 8,432 candidates, all vying for 543 seats. And to top it all, uh, 968 million uh, registered voters, out of which 645 turned up to vote. However, uh, the crux of the matter, as we are discussing, is not merely in the logistics, but in, in the integrity of the electoral process itself. And echoing global trends, uh, campaign media and finance remain the Achilles heel for the Indian elections. So drawing on the works of James Clark, Absalon, Garnet and James, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the five critical dimensions of electoral integrity, uh, each pivotal in shaping the discourse. Uh, equality of contestation, uh, it was severely undermined by the financial landscape. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in 2017, the incumbent BJP uh, NDA regime introduced opaque electoral bonds, uh, which allowed limitless anonymous don donations, a practice which was later deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of India. Uh, when the data was released, uh, it revealed staggering imbalance. Uh, the, the incumbent BJP party alone received uh, 6,986 crores, which roughly translates to $93.15 million in donations since 2019. It was 47.5% of the total electoral bonds. Just to put in perspective, the next party in the list of beneficiaries was a regional party, the Trinamool Congress, which got 18.6 million US dollars. So so the financial field was completely and of course data also showed that many corporations and donors donated money um, surpassing their profits uh, there were 30 companies which donated 
return to the incumbent regime after they had been raided by the income tax and enforcement directorates. Uh, with regard to opportunities for deliberation, uh, the space was the space for deliberation was also quite restricted, especially in the established legacy media. Uh, as one may know, media freedom in India has plummeted. Uh, India ranks 159th of the 180 countries globally and is comparable to autocratic regimes like UAE or Russia, according to Reporters Without Borders. Uh, between 2014 and 2023, in, in these 10 years, 21 journalists were arrested and put in jail and uh, anti-terror laws were used against journalists. Along with that, what we find is, uh, you know, a concentration of media in the hands of few individuals or entities, which has led to a lack of diversity in viewpoints and the dominance of specific narratives, right? And this is why the opposition often alleges suppression of media pluralism in India. And a term has come to be coined, it's called Godi media, rhyming with Modi. Godi means on the lap of the government. And it has become a popular nomenclature to, for the mainstream media in India. Uh, studies by, uh, you know, uh, media watchdogs, uh, one by News Laundry that tracked 400 segments between February 1st and April 12th, before the election in 2024, showed that 52% of the airtime was spent criticizing the opposition, not the government. And another 27% of the time pushed a pro-government narrative. And even the foreign media had to face the brunt. As you know, the BBC's office was raided after it aired a controversial documentary. Australian Broadcasting Corporation, South Asia Bureau Chief had to leave the country and so many. Uh, when it comes to electoral management, uh, the Election Commission of India uh, has long been lauded for its impartiality, but it faced unprecedented scrutiny in 2024. Uh, concerns mounted over compromised autonomy following legislative amendments granting the government power to appoint commissioners. This was not in tune with the Supreme Court directive. Uh, moreover, you know, the ECI's handling of uh, model code of conduct. So there is a code of conduct uh, apply, which applies during the election. So regarding uh, violations of model code of conduct, inflammatory speeches, the opposition uh, complained of partiality, right? And, uh, you know, uh, there were certain, uh, for example, the prime minister uh, repeatedly invoked uh, religious symbolism and also made allegations that the opposition, once it comes to power, it's going to take away people's hard-earned money in the name of redistribution and give it to infiltrator and those who have more children, alluding to the Muslim minority in the country. Uh, and so these kinds of things happened. Uh, talking about equality of participation, of course, uh, formal participation met uh, standards of electoral equality. However, there were some sporadic violence in states of West Bengal, Chhattisgarh and Manipur, uh, political, political clashes and some other clashes. However, the more important and crucial consideration was about everyday participation. And many civil society organizations and opposition parties have pointed out to the increasing social polarization and tension with implications for the largest minority of Muslims. So governance decisions like Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, which is devised to fast track citizenship to non-Muslims uh, from neighboring countries, actually introduced the criteria of religion as a basis of citizenship. Uh, there has been an increasing identification of the government with particular religious community through actions of the prime ministers like consecration of the famous Ram Mandir or the uh, religious ritual at the opening of the new parliament building, right? Uh, and the important fact that remains is uh, in the mid 1980s, the Muslims accounted for 11% of the population and 9% uh, of the seats in the parliament. Today, they are 14% of the population and less than 5% of seats in the parliament. And finally, with regard to certainty of rules of the game, 
selective law enforcement uh, under the guise of corruption probes uh, disproportionately targeted opposition figures. So you have uh, chief ministers of states like Hemant Soren of Jharkhand or Arvind Kejriwal of Delhi. They were jailed prior to the election on corruption charges. Uh, critics argued that this was done to deprive the two parties of their chief campaigner and to paralyze their campaign network. Just prior to the election, the principal opposition party, the Congress's funds were frozen by the income tax department for discrepancies in tax filing from several years ago. So what has happened is, you know, the media reports suggests that 95% of the corruption probes are against opposition leaders and uh, 25 opposition leaders once they switched to the incumbent BJP, 23 of them got a clean sheet of free from corruption charges. But in the face of these challenges, the 2024 elections yielded a transformative outcome. Uh, the Election Commission of India performed its role to ensure somewhat free and fair elections. Uh, the voter turnout, logistical arrangement, administration of polls, ensured that popular will is reflected uh, and notably what has what happened is socio-economic concerns and governance uh, emerged or trumped over polarization and communal rhetoric uh, and so which which is good because it signals a call for accountability and inclusivity in governance uh, the the most interesting was the loss of the bjp in faizabad which is in uttar pradesh this is the site of the ram mandir and here the BJP lost and the opposition won. And despite the imbalance in traditional media and public debate, uh, interestingly, social media played a very important role in shaping voters' opinion. Right? YouTube and Facebook emerged as spaces for oppositional voices. Uh, one can mention about Ravish Kumar, a Magsese award-winning journalist with the NDTV, once NDTV was acquired by the Adani group, supposedly close to the incumbent regime, Kumar opened his YouTube channel, which now has 10 million subscribers. Uh, and, and most importantly, what we think is that an active civil society served as an antidote to such electoral imbalances. For example, the electoral bond scandal came to light because of the dogged efforts of the right to information activists, right? Uh, you know, uh, you have a popular YouTube influencer Dhruv Rathi, who had this YouTube video accusing Prime Minister Modi of cultivating direct, uh, dictatorship that went viral with more than 25 million views. So in the final evaluation, you know, anti-incumbency, governance, regional dynamics of politics, effectiveness of opposition, you know, these all played to ensure that the electoral outcomes have some integrity and despite uh, these serious challenges. Uh, with regard to information and disinformation, we can speak later or if you want, I can talk now. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's hold that for um, for later on. I think we'll have, we'll speak specifically to that um, with it, with everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, Zad. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so in our world tour, we're going to move over to Mexico. Um, and Mexico also had elections. And Miguel, um, you're going to share a little bit about that for us. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Holly and Antobi, for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here uh, sharing the panel with these wonderful colleagues. So what I'm doing today, I'm sharing a few slides and I'm contrasting um, Mexico's legacy, as you call them now, electoral integrity indicators, 2012-2022, with what just happened in the recent election uh, literally one month ago. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to go a little bit beyond that and talk to you a little bit about the, the context the enabling uh, conditions for a free and fair election uh, so that you can assess yourself whether the election was free or fair or not. So without further ado, I'll just share my slides and hopefully, are you able to see them? Yeah, all good. Great. 
Okay, so I'll just jump right into it. And I'll start with the electoral integrity assessment, the average of this course for Mexico, you know, of course, the methodology between 2012 and 2022. This includes uh, four national level elections. And from here, I just want to highlight that, well, Mexico has a, a medium to high electoral integrity score. The, the average is 62, which places it in the mid to high part of the table for, for the Americas, similar electoral integrity score as the United States, which I think it's important to know. And of course, as you know, as every country, there are strengths and weaknesses. Um, the strongest parts of uh, electoral quality in Mexico have to do with the procedures, with voter registration, with election management, with the performance of election authorities. And the weakest uh, components have to do with the context. And this is you know, very common for many countries. Campaign finance, you can see it here with a 41 on a scale of zero to 100. Uh, media coverage, campaign media, 55. And the voting process, but not because of its technical aspect, but related to violence and, and vote buying. And um, this is just to give you, uh, you know, the context of how elections have been, you know, faring in Mexico in the last 12 years. This does not include the latest election in 2024, a month ago. But what I want to say is that from you know my own assessment and other experts, 2024 was not an exception. And the scores, of course, we don't have them yet, you know, um, but the strengths and the weaknesses remain. However, there are some differences. In terms of strengths, we can still say that there was sound election management and administration, uh, electoral procedures, uh, there was widely available information, the voting process was easy, uh, election officials were professional. And I'll just give you two examples. The first one is the electoral register. It's one of the most updated and accurate in the world where, and there are 333 monitoring committees, one at the national level, 32 at the state level, and 300 at the district level, where all political parties can view and review the list and challenge if they see that, you know, there's a repeated name of or if someone has deceased, of course, they contrast it with the civil registration lists, etc. So you have 333 filters, plus the, the staff, the public officials in charge of the electoral register are very impartial, very professional. Uh, another good example is the setup of the polling stations. <clears throat> Around 170,000 polling stations were set up in the country. That's a big number. Well, maybe not as, as big as India, probably a tenth of that, but that's a big number for Mexico. And out of those 170,000 polling stations, only 23 of them were not set up. So 99.85% of polling stations were set up. So as you can see, technically, and these are just two examples and being quick, um, reveal the quality, the technical quality of the organization of elections in Mexico. However, there are some challenges. I already talked about the low scores regarding campaign finance and campaign media, which tell you a little bit about the, the, the playing field and how level it is. Uh, but in addition to this, for this election, I would highlight three main challenges. The first one is violence. You probably heard about that. Most international coverage had to do with it. Uh, 35 candidates or wannabe candidates, you know, before they registered, were killed in this election. Uh, it's a big number. Violence increased 150 percent versus the 2021 election, which was the previous national election with the midterm election. Um, there were also attacks and weakening of election bodies. Uh, there were many ways to do this. One was through budget cuts. So the National Electoral Institute received a budget cut, but there are also 32 electoral bodies for each of the states, the provinces in Mexico, and 90% of them received budget cuts. And there were some that were cutting their budget more than 50 or 60%, which of course really made difficult for them to conduct an election and to do their job. Uh, in terms of the electoral tribunals, both the local and the federal ones, about 35% of them, uh, the judges, the magistrates that make, you know, that are part of them were not 
were not appointed. So instead of having three judges, you had two or one, or instead of having five, you had four or three or two, which made them more vulnerable to political pressure, right? And of course, there were constant attacks through discourse, through speech from the government against the election bodies, which undermined you know, to a certain point their credibility. I also talked about the, the level playing field. It was not really leveled. There was a massive use of state resources benefiting the incumbent. Also, public officials were not impartial and professional. Uh, they, uh, they supported the incumbent government and social programs that have to do with, uh, you know, scholarships and, and cash transfers for different parts of the population. About 25% of the population in Mexico gets these direct cash transfer were conditioned. So people that are public officials that, you know, spread and distributed these cash programs conditioned them to the support of the uh, incumbent government. So um, there was a problem in that regard. Um, so I was telling you that it's not only about the technical part of the election. And here I just used international ideas, global state of democracy uh, indices that, that measure other aspects that go beyond a representative government and that go beyond uh, free and fair elections. It measures other you know, aspects such as judicial independence, the predictable enforcement of, of laws, uh, gender equality. And here it's a similar story to, to India um, and there's 22 indicators. There's been declines in 12 out of those 22 indicators. And the ones with the biggest declines um, have to do with effective parliament. This is Congress doing the job of reviewing what the executive is doing. Now it's mostly rubber stamping what the uh, executive wants to do. Declines in basic civil liberties, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of the press. The clients in judicial independence, there's been a lot of pressure and coercion against the courts from the high courts to the local tribunals. Uh, there's been a decline in predictable enforcement of the law and in the participation of, of civil society. So with this last image, and I know that I don't have a lot of time left, I wanted to convey this, this image, right? So picture, you know, you have a train, but you might have like the, the most wonderful a modern, elegant train with the best engine and the best driver, the best conductor. But at the end of the day, it's not only about the train, right? It also depends on the quality of the tracks and the quality of the terrain. In this picture, I think the tracks are bent because of ex excessive exposure to heat. But I think this is a good analogy. This is a good metaphor of Mexico. Um, as I said, 2024 was not the exception. The, the quality of election bodies, the technical quality of, you know, organizing the election, of, of training election officials, uh, the availability of information, the voting process, you know, on election day, things went smoothly. However, the, the context was a little bit challenging. And as you know, an election to, to be called democratic needs a, a set of enabling conditions, basic fundamental uh, freedoms so that, you know, political parties can campaign, so that citizens can discuss and contrast, so that newspapers can criticize if needed the government, you need a rule of law. And in terms of those two, I would say that the Mexico's last election was was a little bit lacking, but, you know, we can discuss more about this on the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Um, yeah, lots of interesting things in there that we'll want to discuss um, a little more in the Q&A. Uh, so our last election, we're going to head back up to the UK. Um, and Toby's going to speak a little bit about what I think is the most recent election on this panel, um, the UK elections. Go for it, Toby. Thanks, Holly. It, was, it, it is pretty recent, although it's made a little bit out of date by the French election, uh, which is the, the most recent election, and perhaps we should add someone on here to talk about the French election as well. So thank you everyone. Thank you for all your uh, great talks about the different kind of countries. Um, and I'm not sure where UK is gonna feature in any future index, whether it's gonna be up there with South Africa, where it sounds like things went quite well, um, or there can be more sort of endemic problems. But um, I guess to give it a little bit of context, electoral integrity ahead of the UK general election, which took place um, on Thursday, um, has been on the agenda 
So the government, the incumbent government, was the Conservatives, and they had been raising concerns about voter fraud uh, for a number of years. And they put into place uh, the Elections Act, which was passed in 2022, which meant that the elections that just, just took place took place under slightly different rules. Uh, the most foremost of those was that we had photographic voter identification requirements for the first time. So prior to uh, this Thursday's election, you could simply turn up at a polling station and say your name, you'd be marked off the electoral register. We went to a very different system in which uh, everyone had to provide full photographic identification and a very quite a restricted number. There was restrictions in terms of reducing the independence of the Electoral Commission. So this is the first time we had a parliamentary election where the Electoral Commission was not formally independent since it was first established that was at, at the turn of the century. And the other major change was that we had extensions uh, to who could vote. Uh, overseas electors uh, could, could had unlimited periods during which they could vote. Previously, a UK citizen who had been living overseas for over 15 years lost their right to take part. This election was one in which everyone could, could participate. Um, so, well, so what happened? Well, um, here's the, the, the result in one, um, or one graph in a way. It was a landslide. It was a, a, a landslide for the majority uh, for the Labour Party. Um, Keir Starmer won uh, with a 192 seat majority and so you can see hopefully from the figure that in the long sweep of elections since uh, since 1918 he was right up there in terms of um, the size of, of, of the majority um, so ahead of Tony Blair's 2001 landslide ahead of Clement Attlee ahead of Margaret Thatcher's uh, parliamentary um, majorities so in one sense concerns about or discussion about electoral integrity sort of very quickly disappear. Uh, we notice these things, we notice problems perhaps a bit more when the election's close. And so, as we're hearing from Anna, where the, you have discrepancies on ballot papers that you know that can throw um, the outcome if, if, the, if it's very narrow. But there was something quite particular about this uh, result, which was that this, the popular support that gave the party this uh, majority was actually very narrow. So if I cut here um, to, to this graph first, it, this shows the support for, the, for each of the main political parties since 1945. And one thing to note is that support for the main two political parties, the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, has been going downwards ever since 1945, broadly speaking. In turn, the real trend has been for people to, to not participate. Um, the landslide actually was for, for non-participation. So the 192 seat majority that the Labour government uh, has was actually only located from 33.8% of the votes, or in practice, only 17.7% of the electorate decided uh, to, to vote for them. So it was a very, very uh, small uh, majority. It's a basis for the majority in, indeed, which opens up some of the questions about why, well, why did, um, you know, what led to, was, was leading to, to, to low turnout? What is the, what's the basis for this? And I think a lot of this is not necessarily electoral integrity issues. Um, it, it's obviously partly down to the parties themselves to to broaden their appeal and to, to reach out to the electorate. And part of the story of the election was the surge in support for, for smaller parties, in particular Reform, who gained five uh, MPs for the first time, but based on a very large, uh, millions of people voting for them. Also the Greens uh, were important there too. But certainly there are some electoral integrity issues. So one question is about voter identification. What impact has this did this have? There was a decline, uh, it's undoubtedly the case in terms of um, turnout from the last election. So if I, if I go back a slide, um, and this is the one that's been quite widely, widely shared. Uh, in many constituencies, there was a drop of around five percentage points. Now, given that this was expected to be an election where there could 
very likely be a change in government. Uh, they were expected to change in government. We'll see whether this, whether that kind of plays um, a, a role. A second question is about the low levels of voter registration that we, fact that we have in the UK. Uh, the UK does not have automatic voter registration. I think it should. Uh, there's lots of research from Holly and I that shows that countries that have automatic voter registration in place um, tends to have much more accurate and complete electoral rolls. And from studies that I've done with Alistair Clark, what, a common theme is that you do get people turning up at polling stations and wanting to vote and being surprised when the name is not on the electoral register. They think they're registered because the government kind of knows um, uh, about them. A third question there is also about the overseas voters. So uh, by some estimates, the election enabled uh, an extra 3.3 million people to be enfranchised. 3.3 overseas uh, UK citizens were eligible to vote in this election. And therefore, maybe they increased the size of the electorate, um, but probably voter turnout amongst them was uh, especially low. So this here is an example of one overseas elector uh, who people will be familiar with, uh, Professor Pippa Norris, who received her postal votes in the US. Um, she was eligible to she was on the on the list of registered electors, um, but like many living overseas have very little opportunity to realistically cast, uh, send that ballot paper completed and have it counted in, in time uh, for the election um, going, going forward. So something that the UK has to think about quite carefully is can we enable internet voting for overseas electors or potentially maybe email voting? Is there some way in which that this process can be fast tracked or do we need to alternatively extend the electoral process so that it takes place over a longer period of time so that the snail mail ballots can go around the world and, and come back in, 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 in time. Um, just one quick thing, um, just a quick reflection because people mentioned it. The EMBs were um, kind of mentioned quite a, quite a few times, I think, in the previous uh, presentations in South Africa, uh, but also um, there in, 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 in Hungary and, and, um, and Mexico. We didn't see lots of claims that the electoral authorities were performing poorly in the UK. Um, there, weren't fault, there weren't false claims like we've heard, heard there in South Africa, false claims on social media. There were some cases where people didn't receive their postal ballots, but I think maybe that's just the number of postal ballots that, that, that were involved. But there's certainly been a major pressure in the UK has been cuts to EMBs, cuts to the local turning officers and their teams. And maybe the, if this election had been much closer, um, and there'd been much more kind of scrutiny um, take, taking place there. There could have been this could have been a much kind of bigger um, issue, and something which needs to be um, considered um, overall in the future. But overall, the main story from the UK is it was a landslide, and so people don't look at electoral integrity. But that that low vote share that's given the government a major majority is one of the key sort of talking points at the moment. Thank you, Toby. Okay, so uh, we've heard from five very different elections. Um, so I'm going to ask one question of all of the panelists, and you actually have to only give one thing. Um, if there was one issue of electoral integrity in the election that you just covered for us, what would that one issue be? Um, so I'm going to uh, start off uh, with Ursula and Kira, maybe, um, and just just one. What would you say that that might be? Yeah, I, I think from my side, it would obviously just be, you know, the trust in the electoral process, uh, you know, the trust in the IEC. Uh, we've gotten great ratings and feedback from election observers, but the opinion of the public isn't necessarily the same. So maybe if there's something, but of course, I'm coming at this question from a misinformation, disinformation mm -hmm. perspective. So this is a lot of what I saw. Um, yeah. But yes, yeah. All right, then. Yeah, but no, but it's interesting, though, especially Kira saying like the trust in the Electoral Commission and trust in the information that people are seeing is is a is a is an important issue. Would that be an accurate assessment? Kira, from your Definitely. observations? I mean, sorry, that feeds into a lot of other issues like voter turnout. And I mean, we have a notoriously low voter turnout. I think uh, what it, 
50%. Yeah, it was, it was a lot below 50%, I think, 48% or something like that. And look, I mean, that was, that is staggeringly low. So it, it's a combination of things, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Anna, what would you say is the one thing that, you know, in terms of electoral integrity that should be addressed? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as I tried to highlight for me, beyond the whole regime manipulative inequalities among the competitors, I think the, the biggest challenge or biggest problem recently is the, is the questionable or non-existent, uh, how to say, it, impartiality and independence of the electoral management bodies. Uh, so that's my problem that we can uh, we we can see some kind of we could see elections before a couple of years earlier some kind of table tennis between the independent courts and the not very independent constitutional courts and the courts were the normal courts were strong enough to protect the basics of a kind of fairness and now mm -hmm. this is what we lost I guess that the impartiality and independence of the courts and the lower level electoral uh, management bodies uh, under, uh, can be questioned. Let me give you one example why. The, hand, the, the handbook uh, that had been published by the National Electoral Office, which is the, the, the top institution, the top body of the EMB, even the handbook had some basic serious failures when it comes namely the counting of formal and informal votes and i guess i, I may, of course if i have you know if i'm in a good will i may say that this was a, a tiny mistake no one recognized but when you know that you have a candidate who will resign at the very final moment and there will be some turmoil around the counting of formal and formal votes and the handbook the official handbook contains a misinformation regarding what counts as a formal and an informal vote. Mm -hmm. And then there will be a term of weeks long uh, around the counting. I, I'm from Eastern Europe. I don't think that this is, this is something suddenly happened because some people, unfortunately, uh, didn't understand their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I find some kind of intention Mm -hmm. in this system and the intention is not to get the 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 lord mayor office but to decrease the public trust in the process by decreasing the public trust in the EMBs that were more trusted institutions so far mm -hmm. yeah thanks I so I hear that trust issue again coming up um Zad what would you say in from the Indian context if there's one thing that needs to be addressed oh. Uh, so if there is one thing that needs to be addressed, I'm going to take the question and say if there is one thing that needs to be addressed in the long run mm -hmm. and in the short run. Okay. So in the long run, the one thing that needs to be addressed is, as everybody is echoing, the impartiality and independence of state institutions which are being seriously undermined. And that is something we need to fix. But speaking precisely about the elections that happened, as I mentioned, campaign finance and media, and it is so very skewed, it was so very skewed um, in the 2024 elections that some kind of, uh, you know, balance in campaign finance and media is very much required and needs to be fixed immediately. Thank you. Yeah, very concise, but, but two very key issues. Uh, Miguel, what would you say? from the Mexican context. Yeah, thank you. I would just say, uh, similar to Saad, a lack of a level playing field. And I think mm -hmm. this would is something to be addressed both in the short and in the long term. Mm -hmm. And to be specific and to use one of the legacy indicators, I would focus on the use of state resources. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a wrongful use of state resources. And by resources, I, knew not, I not only mean financial resources, money, but also material resources, human resources, public officials using their own time, which is, you know, paid by taxpayers, mm -hmm. uh, by the public to support a specific candidate 
or uh, you know, governments, local and federal governments, uh, providing venues, cars, all sorts of support mm -hmm. to the incumbent. And that, of course, contributed to this vote not being uh, fair. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks, Miguel. Um, and lastly, Toby, what would you say from UK? Yeah, so I already mentioned a few things which I'm sort of aware of. I think the thing we don't really know much about is the misinformation, disinformation uh, issues, which I think here are kicked off with in South Africa. I think they are also present in the mm -hmm. UK. So there was a BBC investigation, for example, uh, where they set up several different accounts and could, could work out that people were being micro-targeted, young people were being micro-targeted in key election back, uh, battlegrounds with fake AI-generated videos featuring the party leaders with clips um, which were, you know, included lots of disinformation, misinformation. Uh, the, the now Prime Minister, for example, was accused um, of uh, not prosecuting a case of a serial paedophile when he was uh, responsible for doing that. That was that's not true. It, it is completely in, in, incorrect. But that information was big, was circulate, circulating amongst the younger electorate. That's the problem. What the solution is is a, is a lot less clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that actually is a really good segue into what I wanted to ask next, um, but I'm just also going to flag if anybody has questions for our panelists, you can start popping them into the chat um, and we'll also have about 10 minutes, maybe not a full 10 minutes, but we'll have some time at the end um, to take take your questions. So if you want to start popping them into the chat, the chances we'll, we'll get to them are a little higher if, if you can pop them in there. Um, but I did want to highlight again this issue of mis and disinformation and to how much extent um, that proved to be um, a challenge in the election that's that you were covering. Uh, I think we we talk a lot about how how big of a, an issue missing and disinformation is. Um, and you know it's been it's been hyped as one of the one of the biggest new challenges to elections. So how much did that end up playing out? Do you have any examples to share? Um, and maybe we'll start with Kira on that one since I know that you're an expert in this area of study. Thank you. So, like I mentioned uh, initially, it's quite hard to pinpoint exactly how large the impact of it was. What we can essentially say now is, was it present? Was it not present? I think that's sort of most of the conclusion we can draw. Um, and yes, like I said, definitely it was present. We saw a few specific misinformation campaigns being sprayed. But what I can perhaps add, which I didn't say in my a little speech earlier is that we've done quite well in finding ways to detect and counter it, mm. right? So in South Africa, I also mentioned uh, during 2021, our local elections and before that, um, you know, with the Val Pottinger situation, we kind of got a big fright in terms of how uh, these targeted and misinformation and disinformation campaigns can affect uh, our voters and citizens. So we've kind of done the work to start trying to counter that. In, in this election, we saw the IEC partner with uh, certain uh, organizations that seek specifically to counter disinformation, such as Africa Check. They had a platform called The Real 411 where you could log any case of missile disinformation mm. if you saw it online. Put it in there. And there were fact checkers uh, going through that and publishing sort of the results to say, look out for that. Uh, platforms like Twitter, Facebook, many of them removed uh, these posts. So there was a very quick turnaround in terms of uh, something was posted, someone identified, and it was taken down. So we're getting better at countering it. And I, I suppose as we go forward, we'll also see a lot more legislation um, coming around that also trying to counter it, although that has been quite difficult in, in the African and South African context. So we haven't really seen how that's going to look yet, but there are definitely independent organizations working to counter it who we're now starting to see partner with uh, governments and our election bodies to, to work on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do any of the other panelists want to jump in on this mis and disinformation issue? If I may, I mean, just yep. uh, just a number. Uh, Fidesz, I mean, Hungarian governing party spent more on Facebook and Google and X 
with misinformation than any country in in the European uh, elections are they for uh, for the European and and also where some countries they also had local elections right, like Romania or Poland stuff. So the I guess this number shows that Fidesz spent I guess more than five million euros only for disinformation and misinformation. And what we see here is that the the role of propaganda and the smart propaganda, unfortunately, not this blatant propaganda of former communism, but the smart targeted propaganda is a is a huge problem. And not only countries with its kind of second ranking democratic nature or non-democratic nature, but also in Germany, also in Italy, I see that the the cooperation of far right and the and the multi level uh, multi level or transnational trans European and also transnational level of propaganda and somehow to do with something with this uh, social media platforms I think this this will be probably the biggest challenge of misinformation and 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 uh, um, and manipulation in the in the coming years not to mention the role of AI in generating. Mm -hmm information and 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 uh, and manipulation and also Hungary can be a kind of lab or country uh, a laboratory country of 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 analyzing the impact and the consequences of such issues mm -hmm. thanks Anna uh Zad I saw your your hand up as well yeah I just I just want to echo and just add some things what we find so every political party has their own ecosystem or IT cell as we call it especially the BJP, the incumbent BJP has made, but all political parties have it. What we find in India is, um, you know, surrogate ads and uh, uh, shadow pages. So you have Google or Meet, Meta having its own voluntary codes. And so you have the, the political parties would buy pre-existing uh, sites or pages which have something and then they run it surrogate ad. So it helps in two things. Uh, you know, the, the election commission cannot hold these accountable for the campaign finances because these are done by anonymous people. And secondly, any of the voluntary, you know, the codes of conduct imposed by Facebook and others, because these sites have already have got all the permissions. Now these are used. So you, you suddenly see a burgeoning of uh, Facebook pages just three months prior to the election, they do this misinformation, disinformation, and after the elections are gone, then they again just, you know, just close down or shut down or not shut down, but just remain. So this is something that I wanted to add. Uh, and also one more thing, just, you know, this Indian election showed that we have uh, always expressed concerns about social media as a venue, as a medium for disinformation and misinformation and hate mongering. But in this election, uh, you know, when the mainstream media uh, becomes uh, very lopsided, social media emerges as an alternative and autonomous voice. And in this election, we saw civil society groups, you know, Alt News and Boom and other organizations, they would come up with fact checks. So it's not only the government who is doing fact checks, these are civil society groups using social media to do it. And remember, you know, India is the country which has the longest and the largest internet blackouts in the world. And, and media is not particularly free. So it's a little more complicated uh, about how we should think about social media. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Sad. Uh, yeah, Miguel, you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. I, I was just going to say it's, it's difficult to measure the, the extent and the impact of this information, misinformation. But what I can say is that for Mexico, there was a significant increase for the 2024 election. And I can give you one fact. Uh, deep fakes increased about 600 percent between 2022 and 2023, and then 800 percent between 2023 and 2024 this election year. Um, specifically surrounding Election Day that I am aware there were several uh, disinformation campaigns with a wide reach. There was one that accused the candidate of wanting to, the opposition candidate of wanting to eliminate social programs. There was a fake ad of a candidate declining for another. Uh, after uh, the person who won the election won, there was a, a deep fake showing her speaking in Russian 
to uh, you know illustrate the her communist uh, ideology and ties to to Russia and to scare voters. Um, but what I wanted to say is that probably the the one with the most impact is the disinformation and misinformation coming from the president from the president itself. The president, the current president, he's been in power for almost six years. From day one, he has organized morning press conferences that last on average two hours. They start very early in the morning at 7 a.m., 8 a.m. Some of them have lasted for four hours every day, Monday to Friday. And this is done with the intention of, you know, so he can set the agenda and to have a constant presence in media. So whatever he says in the morning, that's replicated by most radio stations, TV, newspapers, etc. And many of the things that he says are lies. Uh, I was checking some, some data and on average, he says 103 lies per conference. So since the beginning of his term, there's been over 150,000 lies um, in total. And that's actually more. I, I, I checked an analysis, 250% more lies of than what Donald Trump said during his entire government. So, you know, this is problematic, right? Because these lies are reported as they are. Of course, there's some institutions, you know, universities, civil society, media that do fact checking, but they do not have the same coverage or same reach as the president, right? So they might have 5,000, 10,000 followers, whereas the president has like a countrywide reach. Mm -hmm. And and these are reported as they are. So, you know, the president said this without actually analyzing whether what he said was factual or not. That's one concern. And the second concern is that these can have an influence on the election because uh, these sayings are not only about public policy, infrastructure, education, energy, whatever, but also go against the opposition, right? And against the candidates. So as I said, you know, that has an impact and contributes to the lack of a level playing field in the election. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it, it's a good segue to the question we have in the chat um, from Savo in uh, Belgrade Institute of Political Studies. So asking a, a few of the different panelists that in Serbia, they have a problem with pre-electoral media coverage, where 80% is going to the ruling parties and 20% to the opposition parties. Is that a problem in other countries um, in terms of the balance of media coverage? Is that something, Zad, I noticed you just raised your hand. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about that? Uh, absolutely. And this is a major problem that we are facing in India. And so when you have the mainstream media, and so basically there is a concentration of media in the hands of few groups or entities or businessmen. And once there is a close alliance between polit politicians or incumbent regimes and these kinds of groups, you have a very lopsided uh, coverage in the media, which happens. Sometimes, as Miguel was pointing out, sometimes it's a more a uh, ploy by politicians to get the news bites and the news time. But here, uh, this is happening in India this time. All the exit polls suggested that the incumbent party, incumbent regime is going to get nearly 400 seats. All the exit polls, major exit polls, all of them, everybody was proven wrong. What happened in mean between and the opposition is calling for an inquiry because the uh, the exit poll showed that the government was coming back with a super majority the share market the stock market boomed and when the election results came the stock market crashed so there is an allegation that there is this was a concerted effort to make some money so all of these uh, are, are ruling parties so uh, sometimes we have now we have to think about the interrelation between the legacy media, the corporate big media, and the social media, and how that dynamics is playing out. Um, Miguel, oh, no, Ursula, there we go. Oh, wait, no, you both want. Okay, Miguel, you go first, and then Ursula will go next. Yeah, uh, just to answer the question, uh, in Mexico, um, media ownership is not as concentrated, so there's a diverse ownership. And quantitatively, the, like the National Electoral Institute monitors in terms of you know minutes and hours, the percentage of coverage, you know, done by radio and TV, and that is fairly balanced quantitatively. However, qualitatively, you know, in terms of uh, how the reporting goes and how they present a candidate, you know, with positive or negative traits, 
that that is a problem, but not as significant. Uh, again, the, the the largest problem is the the use of public resources and and governments from the president to local governments in each of the thirty two states. Most of them are ruled by the same party that you know controls the presidency. They constantly go out to media, you know, via press conferences or interviews. And there, the information is, is clearly one-sided. That's why I, I pointed out that one of the other issues was the lack of uh, impartiality and professionalism by public officials, including, mm -hmm. you know, the president and governors. Yeah. And and Ursula, what were you going to say? You'd raised your hand there. I, I just wanted to say that having listened to all the other panelists, I have to say that South Africa actually comes... Uh, out pretty well because in the pre-election period uh, we have listened to on the public uh, media I'm not talking about social media that's a different sphere but on public media have been very balanced there has not been any overt um, propaganda for one or another party uh, there are in-depth interviews conducted daily with various political figures and they are going across the board. And essentially, we have had uh, no brainwashing of any kind, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I, unfortunately, we're getting close to time, or maybe are already a little bit over time. But I did want to ask one final question so every panelist has a chance to kind of um, close things off. Um, so would you say, after your experience thus far in the year of elections, as they say, are you more hopeful or more pessimistic about the future of elections and democracy and the quality of elections and democracy? So let's just do one quick tilt the tab so that everyone can can give us some final comments. Are you hopeful or are you are you worried? Um, so Ursula, I think you you started to talk about it. Uh, did you want to just put a put a a final final thoughts on there? Final thought is that in comparison to the past, we seem to be going uh, towards the right track. But it is a bit too early to, to say, but most people are optimistic. That's fantastic. Thanks, Ursula. Um, Anna, optimistic? Pessimistic? What, what's your what's your consider, considerations? Maybe it's, it's strange, optimistic. Because, yes. I guess because what happens now is not in the lawmaking, not in the in the invisible processes, but right in front of us. And millions can see now how the system can work and what and the and that the only protection is in ourselves, I think, that we cannot trust the institutions, the offices, whatever, but we have to do something on our own. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think, and also that I did not mention in detail, but it's important, this new movement and new party, this is about the the discomfort and and the unhappiness and and the the, the inequality of the people that we have in our and that's why I am I am hopeful that something something now this very ugly process can somehow enlighten the people or open their eyes to the real nature of the system. That's why I'm optimistic. Okay, um, Zad. Ah, uh, I I would say I'm I'm carefully hopeful. Uh, given all the concerns of electoral integrity in India, the election results actually show that democracy and fee and popular will finds its own way of course we have a lot of things to take care of and work towards uh, but uh, I'm, I'm this election results made me happy really happy the incumbent regime lost 60 seats uh, uh, despite everything despite the uh, odds being stacked in their favor so yeah people and an active civil society make me very hopeful, but I'm careful about the institutions. Okay. Okay. Uh, Miguel, what do you say? Well, I'm sorry to say that I'm not as optimistic as, as the other ones. And I, I, I just I base this optimism on, on facts. There's a, currently there's a law initiative that will change many aspects of Mexico's uh, electoral, political, and judicial system 
that will very likely turn this now predominant political party into a hegemonic party regime, very much similar to what Mexico had up till 1997. Uh, just to give you an example, um, this an example this um, this initiative removes eliminates completely pr proportional representation. So we'll go to a first past the post system, and with the elections today, that would mean that one political party would get 88 percent of the seats. And that's a score that you know that you only get like in, in Turkmenistan or places like that, right? So that's that's a concern. Two, uh, it weakens the judicial system. Uh, now judges, magistrates, and justices will be popularly elected, and that's a way to control them through politics, through campaigning, through etc. Uh, there's also initiative to uh, to weaken the uh, electoral institutions. Magistrates of the electoral court will be popularly elected. The Electoral Institute would lose about 85% of its civil servants. So, yeah, I, I am concerned. Does This does not have to do with, well, it does have to do with the outcome of the election, but it's mm -hmm. it's a proposal that is being, you know, made by the incumbent government, which now repeated. So, yeah, I'm, I'm worried. Okay. And uh, Toby? I'd say uh, cautiously optimistic. I think what today does show is that there isn't a, an inevitable overall decline in the quality of elections. You know, there are, there are elections that are going well. We've heard really great stories from South Africa. We've seen elements of uh, countries in, in improving their elections. But at the same time, there are some countries where there are serious concerns and it's going, going downwards. Um, and, that's, and, and that's important too. And it's also just finally, it's remarkable, we haven't once mentioned the US election either so maybe maybe if we had done we'd have a very different uh, perception but i think that's important if we take the us out of the story because uh, that kind of dominates global mm -hmm. kind of media coverage about elections electoral integrity narratives about democratic backsliding we see a much more complicated picture around the world and a very different picture and i think that's important too mm -hmm. wow okay so thank you so much everybody for for your comments your um all of your uh really interesting insights um, so I'm just going to share this screen again, just so everyone can see what's coming up today uh, and uh, the rest of the week. Um, so we have another panel happening in about an hour and a half, maybe less than that because I went over, but chair's prerogative. Um, and then we have panels going on for the rest of um, the rest of the week. So it'll be a really fantastic time to, to chat. There'll be some more academic focus papers coming soon as well. Um, and so please do join us. Come back uh, as much as you can. And we look forward to continuing this discussion and in the coming days. So thank you panelists. Thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you again very soon.